Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Neha Nanda. I'll be talking about epidemiology of COVID-19 and uh, transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 virus. As all of us know, COVID-19 is caused by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to a family of coronaviruses that we are very familiar with. In fact, we've had previous epidemics associated with uh, coronaviruses, namely um, uh, MERS and SARS-CoV-1. SARS-CoV-1 uh, caused an epidemic in early 2000s. And in 2009, we had an epidemic with MERS, that's Middle East uh, Respiratory Virus. Also, we have several human coronaviruses circulating that are responsible for common colds. SARS-CoV-2 is obviously a novel virus. What we know about it today is that it exhibits 72% genetic similarity with SARS-CoV-1. What we know today is that SARS-CoV-2, the reservoir for this virus is host reservoir are bats. And it appears that the intermediate host is a pangolin that facilitates transmission to humans by contact. In terms of incubation period, we know today that it varies from two to 14 days, median time being five days. With this disease, what we are learning is there is an, th there are asymptomatic carriers also, and also there are pre-symptomatic, uh, there's a pre-symptomatic phase. Pre-symptomatic phase simply precedes the clinical illness, and this phase has been commonly identified in younger children who don't get uh, severe disease. Asymptomatic carriers are people who never develop disease, and um, in the world of epidemiology, it's believed uh, that asymptomatic carriers are typically responsible for less than 5% of the transmission. Uh, we do not know if that's the case with SARS-CoV-2. What we have learned is that there have been cases associated with asymptomatic carriers in Singapore and in South Korea. I think we all know that um, the first case was reported in Wuhan in China in December last year. Since then, it has spread to all the continents. Um, and the case fatality rate, the CFR that has been listed here is simply an average of all of all continents, of, of, of all the continents. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention is the numbers that are listed here are primarily driven by the availability of testing. Uh, it's very variable, as you can see the numbers. Um, in Germany, the mortality rate is only 0.7%. In the US, depending on the study that you look at, it's anywhere from 1.7 to 3%. Italy, it was very high, around 11%. And China, again, depending on the study you look at, it was 1.5 to 3%. Let's talk a little bit about the trends in the United States. Thus far, we have tested about 2 million people and our positivity rate is approximately 20%. So we have around 390 cases. Our mortality is 3%. As we all know, the first case was identified in Washington state um, in January this year. Uh, today, we have around 390 cases in the United States. The epicenter is in uh, New York. Uh, the, number, the number 390 is from yesterday. They've gone up since then. What's the distribution? We know that there's a lot of activity in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Michigan, and on this side in Washington state and in California as well. And this map simply depicts that. Um, as we discussed, the incidence of the disease at this time seems to be very driven by the number of tests and the availability of tests in different areas. And as you can see, the number of tests that have been done in New York 
uh, is around 365 and the positivity rate is 41%. For California, we have done approximately 145 tests and our positivity rate is 11%. Let's talk a little bit more about California. So we have 17,000 cases with a mortality of 2.5 to 3%. Um, our positivity rate, as we mentioned in California, is 11%. Of the cases that are identified here, about 15 to 20% require hospitalization. And of those, half of them have required ICU care. As you know, social distancing started mid-March. And initially, it was thought that the surge would be expected in California in um, around April 26th. And now, based on mathematical modeling, uh, we, we feel that it's going to be, uh, it's reported that it's going to be around April 14th. Of course, it's based on assumptions. Looking at our trends in LA County, um, what I'm trying to depict here is basically that there is an upward trend both for the number of cases, hospitalizations, and mortality. I'll get into the details in the next few slides. And this is just magnifying the mortality in LA County. Here are numbers. The total number of cases at this time are 7,530. We are adding about 350 to 500 cases every day. There are clusters in nursing homes um, in LA County. The mortality rate today is around 2 to 2.5%. Uh, in our population, it seems majority of the hospitalizations, about 85% of the hospitalizations that have occurred are in people who are individuals who are more than 65 years of age or have some kind of a comorbid illness. Um, we know social distan distancing started in mid-March. At this time, it's too early to assess the impact of social distancing. Uh, from what we know in 1918 18, with Spanish flu, it took about six to 12 weeks for social distancing to actually show an impact. Uh, so I guess we learn as we go uh, in this era how quickly we will see the impact of social distancing. Let's look at Keck Hospital. These numbers are current as of April 6th. These are simply people under investigation. So on an average, we've had 15 to 20 cases per day. You can see the distribution of patients who are in the ICU and who are not in the ICU. Um, number of positive patients at Keck on an average are around 10. And you can see about 80% of them are in the ICU. Here I'm, I just wanted to share the CFR and the reproductive number of other viruses. Um, so if you look at the case fatality rate, the CFR for Ebola, obviously it was very high, 70%. For SARS-CoV-2, here, uh, here the way they mentioned is 2019 uh, novel coronavirus is about 3% uh, based on what we know today. But as the denominator changes, um, this may change. Uh, you can see the uh, CFR associated with H1N1 is, uh, less th is 0 0.03%. The reproductive number, I'm sure everybody has read a lot about it. Just to reiterate, it's basically a number that tells us how many individuals will get infected from the index case. So, for instance, for measles, if R or not is 12 to 18, that means the index individual case can infect 12 to 18 people. The number for SARS CoV 2 continues to change the reproductive number. Uh, numbers have varied anywhere from 1.5 to 5.5, as is shown in this study. But I think as more data becomes available, it seems like it's around 2.5. But I'm sure there's more to come on this. Let's talk a little bit more about the transmission dynamics of this virus. So the transmission of respiratory disease in healthcare epidemiology has traditionally been classified into either droplet transmission or airborne. 
And this classification employs a arbitrary size of five microns to categorize transmission. Anything that's more than five microns typically is classified as something that will get transmitted by way of droplet. And anything less than five microns is going to get transmitted by way of airborne. Again, now droplet, when the size of the respiratory particle is more than five microns, what that means is that this virus, this respiratory particle will typically not travel beyond six feet and will fall within six feet, will not be infectious beyond six feet. That's what it means. And for airborne, because the size is smaller, the respiratory particle will be able to traverse longer distances that's more than six feet. The challenge with this classification is that it doesn't take into account, importantly, the impact of evaporation on these particles, on the respiratory particles, because what comes out as, what is expelled as a large respiratory particle from the index case may over time become small and give it the ability and thereby being able to traverse longer distances. There are very few peer-reviewed studies elucidating the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 -CoV today. I'll share with you some. So this was a study in New England Journal of Medicine where uh, they looked at the transmission dynamics under artificial circumstances. So they made aerosols rich in SARS-CoV-2 and they, they reported that this virus remains viable in aerosols for three hours. In addition, they also noted that this virus can remain, can be viable on plastic and stainless steel for up to 72 hours. They'd use tissue cult culture to detect the virus so we know it was viable and infectious. Another study that was reported in JAMA is from patients who had mild to moderate disease. And this they, they used PCR to measure the virus. And what they found out was that the air samples around these patients were negative. Swabs that were taken from air exhaust outlets tested positive. So perhaps there were small virus-laden droplets that may have gotten displaced by air flows and were deposited on vents. Um, there is significant environmental contamination that occurs with this virus. So 61% of the surfaces before cleaning were positive, after cleaning all were negative. It's a puny virus when it comes to uh, uh, using disinfectants, it can get easily killed, it's killed easily by H2O2. So based on what we know about transmission dynamics done with this virus. What we know today is that in non-aerosolizing setup, there is no strong evidence to suggest this virus can remain suspended in the air for long periods and traverse long distances. In an aerosolizing setup, we know that they can remain suspended and viable and they traverse long distances. Traditionally, we've used N95, or a PAPA, that's a power, a power air purifying respirator is recommended for aerosolizing procedures and surgical masks, those are the face masks, for non-aerosolizing setups. So current recommendations regarding precautions accordingly recommend for routine care N95 out of abundance of caution because we don't know enough about the dynamics or a surgical mask. For high risk or aer and aerosolizing procedures, or aerosolizing procedures, the recommendations are N95 or a PAPA. And along with that, given the environmental, uh, contamina uh, environmental contamination with this virus, contact precautions are recommended along with eye protection. This slide simply reiterates what I shared with you and there's a schematic here of personal protective equipment that has been recommended. Also, I'd like to mention, as everyone knows, there is a shortage of personal protective equipment across the country. Um, and there are various methods that are being looked at to ensure we are disinfecting 
or sterilizing uh, our our PPE so we can consider reuse of these uh, of of uh, a personal of a personal protective equipment, and um, the modalities that we know today are uh, we are use we are we are using UVC rays or we are using vaporized hydrogen peroxide, especially for respirator masks. And uh, we are doing all this to ensure we have an adequate supply and we can continue to provide care uh, for our patients who are suspected or confirmed to be uh, confirmed to have COVID-19. With that, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much for your time. I will be talking about diagnostic and prognostic assays for the detection and quantification of SARS-CoV-2 among those with SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 disease. The role of diagnostics for identification and management of people infected with SARS-CoV-2 are obvious. A highly sensitive and specific assays are essential and needed to detect and quantify SARS-CoV-2 as well as antibody responses for case identification, for contact tracing, for protection of healthcare workers, clearance from quarantine for those who are um, infected, and to monitor for change in SARS-CoV viral load in various compartments and at various stages of infection or disease. Diagnostics should also be able to be used as prognostic indicators for disease as well as for death, as, as we have um, shown for HIV. Also, um, various diagnostic assays, especially PCR, are used to study viral dynamics in relation to stage of infection, as well as to better understand the innate and adaptive immune responses in relation to viral load, disease, and most importantly, to treatment modalities. When it comes to testing, this slide shows you the, the, the sharp increase in the testing with the availability of commercially available assays. Um, and you can see a large number have been tested just in, just in the last few days. A little background about SARS-CoV-2. It is a member of the um, uh, beta coronavirus. Um, it is a positive single-stranded RNA virus. It has um, it is enveloped and has an I a capsid that is helicoidal. The envelope has this spike protein that is an important protein, as we'll talk about in a little bit, because it it is the uh, uh, protein that binds to the ACE2 receptor. The binding of the receptor triggers conformational changes in the S protein and viron cell membrane fu fusion occurs, either at the plasma membrane level or in the endosomes. In this slide, you'll see what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. In the center is, uh, is the positive strand of RNA in purple, and it has um, multiple proteins, including a membrane protein, a nucleocapsid protein, the spike protein, which we just talked about, and an envelope protein. This slide shows that just a brief schema of how this virus enters into a cell. The cells that have ACE2 receptors include the oral cavity, respiratory tract, cardiovascular system, and many, many other um, uh, cells throughout the body. Once the virus enters the cells it, it, and binds and fuses, it then uh, releases the RNA, which then uh, actually acts like an mRNA and transcribes and makes uh, some proteins that then is used to start the whole machinery uh, along with cellular proteins and the cell machinery to make virus. So what kind of diagnostic tests are we talking about? Most of them are molecular. Um, the serologic tests we'll, we'll talk about for briefly is, uh, are in development or uh, about to be released. That is important for uh, uh, assessing past infection 
and neutralizing antibodies, which will be used for research and for vaccine studies. So the RT-PCR, um, in this situation, you need a reverse transcription because it is, it is a um, RNA virus. Once the virus is um, reverse transcribed and you have a cDNA template, then you, see, you get amplification, as you can see here on the right. And uh, it generally, we do up to about 40 cycles, but you can go higher than 40 cycles. The reverse transcription converts the RNA to the target DNA, and each cycle target is replicated. Each cycle the probe binds to the target. Each cycle the probe emits light signals, etc. Reverse transcriptase qPCR detects amount of viral RNA. It can indicate level of current infection. It can indicate shedding potential. It can be a rapid two-hour procedure. And um, samples need to be processed, of course. So for sampling, um, currently the FDA-approved kits are using nasopharyngeal swabs, and um, as well as uh, some assays can use oral pharyngeal swabs. And um, we are currently assessing saliva in comparison to nasopharyngeal and oral swabs. Other um, other uh, Bio, uh, biologic samples that we'll, we will be testing are serum um, uh, fecal samples using rectal swab. It's, others have also found it in tears. These are two studies that um, uh, show a little bit about the viral dynamics in the throat, nasopharyngeal swab and, and sputum and stool. And looking at the two studies, they were published in Nature uh, as well as in Clinical Infectious Diseases. And what you can see is that pharyngeal shedding was highest really during early infection in the first week of symptoms. And that um, as, as time goes on, the shedding decreases, which is what would be expected. Seroconversion occurs after seven days in about 57% percent of patients. In this next side, slide, you'll see the temporal profiles. In this next study, the overall dynamics of the nasopharyngeal viral load and virus detection and other body parts is shown when fi with five patients who had uh, COVID-19 uh, in France. And as you can see, importantly, the one patient did have viremia, and this was also uh, found in uh, several other studies that uh, demonstrated that viremia may actually be predictive of a uh, poor outcome. In this next study, the group studied digital droplet PCR and qPCR, and as you can see from this um, slide, digital PCR specimens were frequently positive in throat swabs as well as sputum. Um, uh, they, in this particular study, there, uh, there was no virus noted in urine and in blood. So what are the assays that we're talking about? Well, the in-house uh, assays that are being utilized at a lot of sites, including uh, our own, my own lab, uh, is based on the CDC or WHO's primers and probes. It takes um, two hours of extraction, two hours of time of running the assay. And about 21 samples can be done at, at any one time. The CEPID, which is being used at the county, uh, is a rapid test and it um, takes 45 minutes. There is an Abbott test, which is also rapid. The Roche test, which is the test that's being used, used at USC, has a very rapid turnaround. And in eight hours, um, they can run 96 samples and uh, up to 400 in the day. This kind of shows you the machine, what it looks like. It's a rapid, real-time, qualitative assay. It, it is strictly FDA-approved for, for na nasopharyngeal swabs and that need to be collected by the healthcare provider. As you can see from this slide, these are what the reports kind of look like. Uh, they, have a inter they have a control, and in order for a sample to be actually considered positive, the control has to be positive. 
I won't go into details, but you could um, look at this at your own um, pace. The Roche assay, as I said, is more rapid, and uh, the reporting looks sort of like this in terms of what they do, what, what is actually outputted from the system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our in-house qPCR assays and digital PCR assays. The member, um, the, the member of our uh, lab team includes Dr. Olivier Pernet, who um, is leading the effort on digital PCR, and Dr. Zhao Xu, who's working on the digital PCR and qPCR. All along, uh, both of them are working together with Patty Anthony, Julia Fink, and David Lee, who recently joined us and is working on the ELISA assays. So what, um, what, what can I say about quantitative PCR assays? Well, firstly, the commercial assays are qualitative, and they require a nasopharyngeal swab, which requires close contact that directly exposes healthcare workers, putting them at risk for infection. Secondly, we may have a shortage of nasopharyngeal swabs. Therefore, it's essential to assess other uh, collection modalities and specimen types to limit risk to healthcare providers. Sensitivity limits of the current assays are not known at various stages of disease. It also would be very critical to monoviral load throughout uh, disease or, um, or even in, a, in a asymptomatic people. And it's also essential to assess effectiveness of any new treatment, uh, uh, treatment modalities that are being tested. Um, viral load will be critical uh, as a marker for uh, eff eff efficacy. So this is the, we use the, the BioRad uh, PCR machine. Uh, the, the generally, the, the, uh, everything else is similar to all the other PCRs. The RT-QPCR assay um, that is currently being utilized by most in-house uh, assays is the C are the CDC and WHO target uh, probes and primers. Um, the, uh, we are currently using the CDC primers and uh, probes that target the N gene and uh, includes uh, an internal control which is a housekeeping uh, gene that is essential to be able to assure that your assay is um, is a good sample and that there aren't inhibitors in the sample. And so for that reason, all PCR assays has an internal control. The WHO uh, 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 primers and probes uh, will be tested shortly. So the way the uh, assay uh, actually works is that um, the sample is processed and it's combined with primers and probe in the RT-PCR mixture. Three primers and probes uh, are, have been included in the CDC kit only, although only two are going to be used for reporting. There's an internal control. And then there's uh, the PCR assay, which is run, and then uh, it, it can be run up to 40 cycles. The quicker the curve that goes up, um, the, the higher the, the viral load is. You can go beyond 50 cycles, but the current CDC guidelines recommend that uh, a positive test is below 40 cycles. In this next slide, it shows you how what spiked experiments um, that we've done and others have done as well shows you with a negative, it's really pretty clear cut, a negative, uh, there's nothing um, detectable except the control specimen. And then uh, you quantitate the various concentrations based on input, and you could see that we started out with 10,000, 1,000, 100 copies. And uh, a positive uh, needs to be positive um, for all three primers and probes for uh, proteins. Uh, actually, for the CDC, this will be limited to the first two. Um, my, our studies are going to be looking at viral dynamics and pathogenesis of, of disease in relation to 
um, viral vir detection of virus. So SARS COVID-19, um, we believe that SARS COVID-19 will be found in the upper respiratory tract early infection prior to spreading to other compartments such as lower respiratory tract, blood and GI tract. We also are testing self-collecting sampling of the oral cavity using saliva and oral swabs and theirs because we think this may be the optimal samples to be utilized. We also believe that the vir uh, that virema may be predictive of disease outcome and we'll be studying this in the very near future. And we believe that there may be variabilities in the um, viral loads in various compartments as has been shown in some small studies. Um, stool samples have been in the, um, a lot of studies have shown that there, are, um, there is virus detectable for a long time in, in uh, stool. And so there is a question of fecal oral transmission that needs to be ruled out and our studies are planning to do that. Serology is uh, obviously going to be needed very quickly. Um, serologic tests rely on antibodies present in the patient's uh, blood. It uh, relates to uh, immunity, although it, uh, generally you think it's lasting immunity. We do not know how long the immunity lasts with this virus. And um, it's also uh, being used for, will be used for vaccination studies. There are very different kinds of uh, assays. ELISA and then there is Western blot, which won't be used. Um, um, the ELISA is, is a rapid, can be, um, is, can be fast, can be scaled up quickly. So in general, the ELISA assay is based on antigen uh, binding um, to antibody of the patient's antibody, which is then followed by a um, antibody that is uh, anti-human conjugated secondary antibodies such as mouse anti-human or rabbit anti-human. Uh, this can be adapted to be B-based or it could be coded, antigen could be coded on the a bottom of 96 well plate. And there are other uh, possible modifications, including double sandwich, which you may need to do for uh, IgA assays. Um, currently, the commercial assays will be looking at IgG and IgM, but it's very possible that IgA may be very important, especially since this is an oral cavity, um, a virus that, that replicates in the, uh, predominantly in the beginning in the oral cavity. Um, so the ELISA assay uh, will be um, uh, being uh, developed shortly. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rishi Mehta, and along with Anush Ori, we put together some slides on clinical presentation, risk stratification, and clinical course as it relates to COVID-19. So we know there's variability among presenting symptoms but what brings them to the hospital in large part is this triad of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, with fever being reported in over 80% at some point during hospitalization. It's important to recognize, though, that 50% uh, may not have a recorded fever on admission, and that's due in large part to the fact that the fever curve tends to be intermittent. While it's known that this triad exists, there seems to be variability within cough and shortness of breath. And for shortness of breath, this may be because of deferring public health uh, admitting criteria, as in some areas, patients are getting admitted with fever cough alone, while in others, you're requiring the shortness of breath and that triad to get that admission. Less commonly, patients present with fatigue and URI symptoms like sore throat. And it's important to note that in general, the majority of these patients are presenting in a non-severe manner. More recent studies have brought up other presenting signs or symptoms. Early on, GI symptoms were considered not common, but recently a study in the American Journal of Gastroenterology showed that 50% of hospice patients had GI symptoms on time of presentation. However, two important caveats. The first is that the majority of these patients had fever or respiratory symptoms brought them in. The second is that the paper includes anorexia or loss of appetite as a GI symptom, and that could be argued to be a systemic symptom. 
In fact, if you remove anorexia or loss of appetite from the GI symptoms and describe GI symptoms as only diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, then only 20% of hospitalized patients reported GI symptoms. ANT symptoms, in the beginning, it was largely anecdotal. The clinicians self-reporting when their patients had loss of smell and later found to be COVID positive. Now we have a paper that suggests that loss of taste and loss of smell is a common symptom. However, this was study, study was done with a questionnaire after the fact. So it's unclear if this is a real preceding symptom or is it that the loss of taste and smell is common in respiratory viral illnesses. So until better data comes out, this may just be an association. So in addition to the signs and symptoms, patients who require admission tend to have lymphopenia and elevated inflammatory marker with a low procalcitonin. Patients who develop more severe disease have lower absolute lymphocyte counts and higher inflammatory markers, which leads to the broader question of who gets hospitalized and of those who develop more severe disease. Existing data shows comorbid conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, CAD are strong risk factors for hospitalization. It's been reported that patients who develop severe disease have elevated D-dimers and tend to be older in age, specifically age over 65. But age distribution may be different in other countries than China. So what's interesting is a recent review not limited to one country looked at predictors of severity and actually showed that age greater than 50 is a predictor of severity. This study also reaffirmed comorbidities and elevated inflammatory markers like CRP are predictors of severity. In regards to death, the paper showed that age over 60 and history of CAD were two of the leading independent predictors of death. Now with the United States leading the world in cases, unfortunately, we can look at our own data for risk stratification. What we see is that COVID-19 knows no age. In fact, you can see here that young people tend to get COVID-19 more than older individuals if you break it down below the age of 55. But in regards to hospitalization, 45% of hospitalizations are over the age of 65 and 80% of deaths are over the age of 65. So we can safely say that elderly aged individuals are more at risk for severity. When we look at data for only hospitalized patients with COVID-19, we reaffirm that the majority are over 65. But we also see what that review show that a high amount of individuals over the age of 50 are being hospitalized. Those between 50 and 65 seem to be making up the majority of that under 65 that are getting hospitalized. So it's important to note Age over 50 is a risk factor for hospitalization. When looking at US data regarding comorbidities, we find what previous studies have shown. That hypertension, diabetes, lung disease, and CAD are the underlying conditions prevalent in those requiring hospitalization. But perhaps due to a difference in makeup of our population, here we see obesity as second only to hypertension as a comorbidity associated with hospitalization. So it's an important risk factor to be aware of. Just as we previously didn't consider age over 50 or obesity to be a risk factor for hospitalization, we also up until now have largely ignored race. But with states reporting their data with a breakdown of race, we are seeing a racial disparity. Sadly, in Louisiana, 70% of states' deaths are black and blacks make up only 33% of the population. Similar racial disparities seen in New York and unfortunately also in LA County. Up until this week, CDC had yet to release a racial breakdown in COVID-19 cases. But as states showed racial disparity, the CDC, while not releasing fatality as it relates to race, released data from the month of March this week, suggesting that Blacks do disproportionately require hospitalization. Theories to explain this disparity are obviously being debated, whether it's due to socioeconomic concerns, systemic racism, or a higher proportion of Blacks having hypertension and diabetes, and that's why they're getting more hospitalized. Likely is not gonna be teased out for a while. And in the meantime, it's just important to know that while Blacks make up 14% of our 
country's population, they're making up 33% of our hospitalizations. Along with age and comorbidities, as well as inflammatory markers being elevated, race should be a consideration for risk factors as well. So when patients are actually hospitalized, there are trends in their clinical course that have been identified. A Lancet study looked at definitive outcomes for 191 hospitalized patients, which gives us a trajectory of disease course. In this study, 137 patients were eventually discharged, and unfortunately, 54 patients did not survive. So let me put the pointer on for everyone so that I can orient on this graphic that's busy. But what you can see here is the x-axis is days, median days, so it's time. The y-axis is symptoms and events. And then there are these noted unique events that are on both the survivor and non-survivor graphic. Now, when we look at this as a whole, we see that in both survivors and non-survivors, dyspnea tends to occur on day seven of symptom onset, which is described as fevers and cough, which works out nicely since we previously talked about clinical presentation being the triad of fever, cough, and dyspnea. Now, in both groups, patients may develop sepsis, patients may develop ARDS, and patients may eventually require the ICU, which tends to occur on day 12 of symptom onset or day five, six from when dyspnea occurs. Now, the differences in these groups is that the non-survivor pool, there was invasive ventilation, there was acute kidney injury, acute cardiac injury, and secondary infection. But overall, this evidence suggests that by day 12, symptom onset, or day 5-6 from when dyspnea occurred, disease can be predicted based on the stability of the respiratory status, and then we know that predictors of the stability depend in large part due to age, comorbidities, race, and inflammatory markers previously mentioned. So if the Lancet study suggests that often when patients require invasive ventilation, their mortality rate is profound, this, is, this has been reaffirmed in early ICU studies. But more recent data from Seattle and the UK has suggested that the mortality rate entering the ICU, even if requiring intubation, is not as high as previously reported. Now, whether that has to do with different approaches towards these ICU patients in the United States or something inherent to our population, that's something to be further investigated, and I'll leave that to our ICU colleagues. So if the majority of these hospitalized patients are discharged to home, what becomes our criteria? So the disease course, as previously described and reaffirmed in further literature, suggests that symptom onset, fever and cough, in relationship with the day of presentation is key to the DC process. Dyspnea is the driving factor because the trajectory of the disease suggests that dyspnea starts on day seven of fevers and cough. And by day 12, patients may or may not develop ARDS. They may or may not need the ICU. So by day 12 of symptom onset, or as mentioned before, day five or six of when dyspnea starts, we can see kind of where the direction of the patient is going. And if most patients are admitted a few days after dyspnea starts, which is what we often see in our Keck Hospital and LA County Hospital because you need a fever, the cough, and dyspnea typically to get admitted, then we can say within a few days of hospitalization whether or not the patient's stable for discharge. And if we know that dyspnea has a median duration of 13 days, then HOMO2 is not a barrier so long as there is improvement in stability. Now, given the fever is a median duration of 12 days, it's definitely a consideration, but lack of fever is not a prerequisite for discharge. More pointedly, cough is not a consideration given that patients can have a cough on average up to 19 days after symptoms start. So taken together, Keck and County has developed these protocols. So Keck, a step-by-step -step protocol you can see here, has been implemented, and if an attending determines clinical stability, then with the coordination of an interprofessional team, a patient can be thought to be started the DC process. So long as they are safe to be home and have high home isolation precautions, 
Now, the Department of Health suggests lack of fever for three days and the patient be beyond seven days of onset. But we know from previous slides and the data that so long as there's respiratory stability and improvement, then the patient can still go home. It's just that the DOH needs to be notified and further isolation precautions probably needed. Then when our patients are discharged, a follow-up phone call is made, which we are trying to currently automate. At LA County, a safer at home program has been instituted, which like Keck, there's a daily review of COVID cases that occurs in which early recognition of patients with improving improvement so that they may be discharged. And just as with Keck, O2 requirements are not a prerequisite to keep a patient hospitalized, as the evidence has suggested. And then once the patient's discharged the county, a post-discharge phone call is set up, just like what's going on at CAC. So with that, here are our references, and I thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Zia Borok, and I'm going to review today um, what we understand so far about the pathophysiology of severe Ill COVID illness. Um, and thanks to Shanti Kumar and Peter Marshall, who helped put these slides together. So I think what we know is that there is a widely varying spectrum of um, presentation and based on an early Chinese CDC report in JAMA in uh, February of 2020, a majority of patients have um, a mild presentation, 81%, 14% have a severe presentation with dyspnea, hypoxemia and significant infiltrates and about 5% um, present uh, critically with respiratory failure, ARDS, shock, multi-organ dysfunction, and developing some developing cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia. However, there is a widely um, varying presentation depending on geographic lo location with some reporting up to 40% um, frequency of ARDS. Hospitalization rates tend to vary between 20 and 30%, and there are ICU admission rates reported of 5 to 11.5%, but of hospitalized patients, it can be as high as uh, 50%. Risk factors for severe illness are um, also based initially on reports out of China, but include increasing age, um, particularly age greater than 65, serious underlying medical conditions, including chronic lung disease and severe asthma, cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, severe obesity, with a BMI greater than, greater than or equal to 40, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and liver disease, with obesity and liver disease having a um, less strong association. Immunosuppression has been associated with severe illness, including immune modulators, high-dose steroids, and HIV, but this is more controversial because there are some reports of patients on um, immunosuppressives having less severe illness. A higher SOFA score and D-dimer greater than one microgram per mil on admission have also been associated with severe illness. Laboratory features that tend to be associated with poor outcome include lymphopenia, elevated liver enzymes, elevated LDH, elevated inflammatory markers including CRP and ferritin, elevated D-dimer, and coagulation dysfunction, and a note here that fibrinogen may uh, and often is increased in contrast to uh, what's normally seen with DIC. So the mechanisms of hypoxemia are emerging, and whereas initially it was attributed to being entirely an ARDS picture, uh, recent literature indicates more that this is ARDS-like. And what I'll highlight here is uh, what the features are, as well as how it might differ from typical ARDS. The onset is sometimes more than one week from presentation in terms of the onset of hypoxia. There are not always bilateral diffuse opacities. And in a recent um, opinion by uh, Gadanoni et al. that was in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, they were describing two subtypes really of a typical presentation with low compliance, a significant right to left shunt, and some recruitability and response to PEEP, like what we would see in regular ARDS, and then a group with a more atypical uh, presentation having preserved lung compliance, low VQ, so areas that are ventilated and not perfused, and a more limited PEEP response 
um, and response to proning. And this is thought to be due to redistribution of perfusion. Um, this is in contrast to regular ARDS, for which the uh, Berlin definition is the most recent description, which includes a, acute onset with usually one, less than one week duration, bilateral opacities on CT or chest X-ray, a PF ratio less than 300 millimeters of mercury with a minimum of five, five centimeters of PEEP, and not explained by cardiac failure or fluid overload. So the compliance is not part of the uh, actual Berlin definition, but typically in patients with um, ARDS, we see uh, reduced lung compliance and more responsiveness to um, PEEP. So in addition to the ARDS-like picture or ARDS picture, there's also been noted to be uh, a subgroup of patients who develop a very strong cytokine response with increases in IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha. And the cytokine increase has been uh, observed to be inversely correlated with lymphopenia, predominantly a reduction of T cells. Um, and also there's a trend to reduce reductions in interferon gamma. Other studies that have looked at other mediators include increases in IL-2, IL-7, GCSF, IP-10, MCP-1, MIP-1-alpha, as well as TNF-alpha. More recently, there's been an observation, and there's a lot of chatter around this, as well as some recent articles on hypercoagulability in these patients, with some patients having evidence of overt DVT and pulmonary emboli, others showing microthrombi, which are now appearing in some limited autopsy series, and the suggestion of there actually being a vasculitis and endothelial abnormality that might be underlying this. And a number of places are actually, and we can talk about this um, in the next grand rounds where we talk more about therapy, are approaching this with um, varying forms of anticoagulant therapy with variable success. So our relevance to this group is obviously, when should you be thinking about ICU admission in a patient that's progressing from severe to critical? Obviously, any hemodynamic instability or uh, multi-organ failure, worsening hypoxemia, um, and these patients do tend to decompensate rapidly. And in terms of strict criteria, I guess right now we're using um, an oxygen requirement greater than six liters nasal cannula or high flow greater than 30 liters per minute or a requirement of 60% FiO2. Um, and that would be an indication for transfer to ICU for possible intubation. So to put this all together, um, this diagram nicely summarizes, I think, the thought phase, which is again hypothetical about the different phases of this disease. So um, there's an early stage, which is early infection and the viral response phase, which might include mild constitutional symptoms, uh, fever, dry cough, diarrhea, headache, which is where some patients present. Um, and then they seem to progress to a more acute or pulmonary phase with shortness of breath and um, hypoxia, which in some patients then progresses to a profound host inflammatory response with hi hyperinflammation and evidence of ARDS, SIRS, shock, and cardiac failure. Um, I know that this varies, and I don't think that you can separate these phases that clearly. I think there's a merging between them. We've seen patients coming in with elevations inflammatory markers, even at the mid phase, that then tend to progress. But this is probably a nice framework to um, think about this. This actually came from Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation, where they were evaluating effects of immunosuppressives um, on the manifestations of COVID, um, which is... Um, wh why the reference is from here. Um, but I think that this is a nice framework for um, further discussion of um, how we approach these patients. And I think therapeutically, this is going to be very important because as they point out, if you give um, the anti-inflammatory mediators in the early phase, it may have no effect. And in fact, steroids might be worse. Whereas uh, if you give antivirals in the later phase, they may have no effect at all. Thank you.